Hey, how are you? I'm Slice of Otaku, and Star vs. the Forces of Evil Battle for Muni has been insane. We received eight episodes total. Although it's a cohesive story, these are technically eight episodes, so, so there's just so much to cover with all this. Alright, so when it comes to the episode Return to Muni, we actually begin with something rather mundane. Marco is feeling depressed, as we expected from the promos, and this is because Star has left. Star left abruptly at the end of season 2 and he doesn't really have an explanation as to why she had to leave so fast so he's just sort of empty right now and she had all those unrequainted feelings so yeah he's just moping around and his parents come down and his mother attempts to comfort him. And I really do like that they began on a human note, that they began on Earth with this episode because it doesn't seem like we're going to be getting much Earth content when it comes to the rest of Season 3 based on the outro and the intro and just everything that happens in this whole movie event. But anyways, Marco is moping around and just trying to feel as sad as possible and is remembering Star's favorite cereal and Star is actually watching him with the all-seeing eye spell. And her usage of the spell is actually pretty peculiar to me because based on information we gather from later events in this Battle for Muni event, we know that magic is on the fritz and that the usage of Star's wand would alert Toffee as to her location and the fact that she's able to use this spell is this spell different because it's Eclipse's spell? It's one of Eclipse's forbidden spells. Is that something that changes it? I don't really get that. That doesn't really make sense. Like, that's the only explanation I can think of. But at the same time, even that doesn't really make sense because it is magic. It is perpetuated by the wand as well. And so I'm pretty curious what the case is with that. But anyways, Star, after confessing her feelings to Marco, is pretty open about how she feels about him. She openly says, oh, he's just so cute and things like that. And you know, it's it's like a sort of change in her character. She's kind of come to terms with her feelings. And so I know that the Starco shippers are just <laughs> having a field day with all this content. But yeah, Star is pretty loud when it comes to her assessment of Marco. So her mother tells her to quiet down and she apologizes and is told to check upon the Magical High Commission. Omni, Hecapu, and Romulus are all tied onto this carriage and they're floating up like balloons. And we don't really get an explanation as to what's the deal with all that. Because if you remember, in their battle against a toffee-possessed Ludo, although they were put into a stasis, their bodies still retained their normal properties. The laws of gravity still applied to them. But here, they're just balloons for whatever unexplained reason. And I suppose Moon may have used magic on them, but once again, there's the whole Fritz situation. And I guess we can presume her magic was working enough for her to do so, considering the carriage was also created by magic and was operating for some time. But even then, if this is in fact due to magic, they should have lost this aspect like all other magical things. And another question is, why do they have to float at all? But yeah, when Star looked up at the Magical High Commission, she does say something regarding Hecapoo, and I don't know, I just really like this line. Oh, looks like old Hecapoo is gonna be an author. And yes, this is an insignificant throwaway line, but this is a new season. For general audiences who aren't like me or possibly you who rewatch these episodes a ton of times over, it's sort of just like new territory all over again. And this line sort of just re-establishes for me firstly that I love the voice acting like particularly of stars like it just I don't know it just works so well in this instance for some random reason well not really random Edinburgh is very talented but the second thing being it quickly jabs you with the signature star versus sense of humor it's witty silly and I just like it and I mean although this entire sequence of episodes is sort of very dramatic and just heavy it is important that they implement humor in it because it is a cartoon and they want to have fun. They want you to really enjoy yourself and, you know, adding a spice of humor does kind of ease our nerves a bit, make us, rem reminds us that this is Star and it's not gonna just be like a total nightmare the entire way through. It's not just gonna be drama after drama after drama. You kind of need to chill out a bit. But Star does ask Moon if Lekman is going to meet them at this designated location and if you remember, 
Lekmit did in fact die at the end of season 2. And so Moon actually has his ashes with her and says yes, yes of course. Which is of course a lie. And as soon as that happens, Star notices that their Warnicorn that is actually moving this carriage is looking a bit funny. It poofs and then their carriage starts to downgrade, like it goes into wheelbarrow and then this little red pail, I forgot what those things are called, which has Butterflyer on the side, which is pretty funny. Um, and then they just have nothing. And so I'm really hoping that Moon managed to hold on to Lekman's ashes, like just to keep them, because that would be pretty disrespectful to, you know, show them and then suddenly they're just scattered all over the floor, let's leave it. But to be honest with you, I don't know where she would put it. She doesn't want Star to see it, but she also doesn't have access to magic at the moment. So unless we're following the laws of old school cartoons pulling things out of thin air, our boy Lekman might just be gone with the wind. The magical path that they had been following also disappeared, so they decided to set up camp. Moon attempts to light a campfire with her magic, but is incapable of doing so, and so Star volunteers and her wand begins to emit a green glow, and we all know that that is a no-no. And so Moon tells her to stop, but Star fends her off saying that no, this is normal for my wand, Glossaric had no problem with it. But Moon lets her know that Glossaric is not here and he's probably never coming back considering Toffee has him in his clutches, and also that the wand is corrupted, which she knows of course from her Ludo encounter. Moving on, Moon hears the sound of Ludo's rats and the two go to check it out and mind you, the entirety of this forest is littered with red menacing eyes. It's a background thing, but it doesn't seem like it's dynamic, which is sort of weird in the sense that they're not actually being watched, it's just a background thing. But yeah, Moon notes these rats that they're overseeing to be scouts and that they can easily avoid them, but Star is overly forward in her approach and she just goes towards these rats and she's ready to blast them with her wand. But when Moon abruptly tells her not to, the rats are startled and are aware of their presence. And so Star has to do things the old fashioned way. She goes and gets a stick and beats the hell out of these rats. And guys, no doubt about it, these are New York rats. These rats are way too big and they're crazy. They're throwing each other, like picking each other up and swinging each other like nunchucks and it's wild. But I especially say that these have to be New York rats because they are petty. They got their ass beat, but <laughs> They untied the Magical High Commission and let them float away. Like, you didn't have to do that. That was just, like, sore losers. It was messed up. It was funny, though. But because of this, the Inflatable High Commission gets stuck up in a tree and has to be retrieved by Moon and Star. And Moon has had it with Star at this point. She's just, like, muttering to herself because... Can you imagine being a mother to a kid like this? Star does not listen to her and she'll she'll push her away, she'll yell at her and just get loud. Too unruly, too hard to deal with. I understand why she shipped her off to Earth. And Star is not really taking this situation as seriously as she should be, but I suppose you could argue that she just doesn't know the full situation yet. She doesn't see the full picture. And even then, seeing the full picture is just gonna make her even more reckless and antsy to be on the front lines. And Moon does in fact get tied up in these vines, but Star rushes to her aid almost immediately, so the danger is pretty much swept away really fast. From there, they make it to the top where they do retrieve the High Commission. And the real purpose of this tree segment was to bring the characters to this sanctuary location. Rather than simply having them walk there and simply find their way, we're given something more interesting. We're given a tad bit of danger to spice things up, but I think the most valuable thing we received from this episode up until this point is simply the interactions between Star and Moon. We have always seen Moon as an uptight mother, but here we see the kind of kid she has to deal with. And as a side note, as uptight as she may come across, she never sends Star to St. Olga's reform school for wayward princesses, so even as a royal, she can actually be pretty lenient. And because they are so different, and they do in fact contrast so much, when they do in fact get along, agree or relate to one another, it is so much more impactful, you really do feel it. But once again moving forward, we encounter the gatekeeper for the sanctuary, and he's like a blue alligator thing, 
and Moon actually gets down and starts making noises to him and he makes noises back and Star just thinks her mother has lost it like she's just gone but the gatekeeper does in fact get to work and he calls his boys and they all just bring up the sanctuary it's weird it's wacky and it makes sense why people would not be able to find this place. And really, the sanctuary, you might as well call it the Hall of Glossaric, because that fool is all over this place, on the outside, the inside, everywhere. And when inside, by turning a valve, Queen Moon erects three pods which Star placed the High Commission in, in an attempt to revive them. But things actually do not go as planned, because what was supposed to revive them is actually corrupted as well, so that's definitely a no-no. And based on information we received from preceding episodes, which we will get to in other videos, we are able to deduce the purpose of this sanctuary. It is a direct well to magic itself. This place would typically contain magic in its purest form, which would revitalize the now comatose High Commission. And so now I'm thinking about Lekmet. Like, I don't expect him to be revived. I don't expect him to come back. I don't want him to because that would kind of just remove the value of his death, in my opinion. But because Lekmet was able to do what the Sanctuary was intended to do, I'm very curious about him now. And on the topic of Lekmet, Moon has shifted to Plan B, which consists of waiting it out, just hiding and staying away from all the danger, just keeping Star safe. She has essentially given up and Star, as we know, will not stand for this. She wants to just go and kill Toffee, easy as that. But Moon makes it abundantly clear that this cannot happen, that they cannot take Toffee. And she even bluntly says that Lekmit is dead. Toffee killed him, just easy as that. And she says that Toffee will stop at nothing until he has his finger back. And none of this phases Star. I mean, she's taken back a bit by the death of Lekmit, but beyond that, she just keeps on going. She's ready to go, guns blazing. And here her mother is pleading with her to stop, to not use her wand because it is corrupted and Toppy will be able to find them if she uses it, which once again, we already talked about. She used it in the beginning of the episode, but whatever. Star is now asking why she should even listen to Moon and what happened to the crazy badass warrior queen mom, which I suppose is due to the painting she saw of her mother defeating Toffee. But Moon replies that she was never that person. She was happy-go-lucky. She was just a normal girl having fun until Toffee and his goons came through and killed her mother. And it is then that Star chills out a bit. And Star says something pretty interesting here. I thought you sent grandma to a grandma farm. I really like the inclusion of this line because it's easy to get caught up in all the drama. Once again, same as the comedy aspect. You need a bit of comedy to ease tension every now and then. But in this case, it's sort of easy to forget that Star is still a kid, to forget that she still retains a level of innocence. And that's what's displayed here. She talks about a grandma farm, which is just like believing in Santa Claus, you know? I mean, she's so ready to kill Toffee, but at the same time, she holds on to things like this. So it just brings her character into perspective. And it's just such a great line to bring things full circle. I love it. And so Star sits down with her mother and hands her the wand. She gives it back because she is not gonna go crazy again. And the two of them smile together. And I told you already, these are the moments that we just live for because of how it's set up. Anyways, Star wants to know the full story. Moon explains that she was about Star's age when it happened and that she really didn't know what to do. So she contacted Eclipsa. And Star is just like bewildered by this. Eclipse is supposed to be dead for hundreds of years, but no, Eclipsa is alive and Moon made a deal with her. And that's the episode. This was incredible. I mean, we accomplished so much in this short of a time span. So you know that there is just so much more to cover with all the other episodes that precede it. And really, when it comes to covering this stuff, I could have done this a number of ways. I could have just reviewed the entirety of this event as one unit, one video. 
I could have done two episodes at a time, but I decided that for me and the way that I make my content, considering how far we actually dip down, one episode is the best structure for us. And so I'm going to be cranking these videos out daily because I know that a lot of you want me to get to the juicy stuff that is to come. But yeah, leave me your thoughts on this episode down below because I'm really looking forward to what you have to say about all this. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.